Mustang and Yukon and Oklahoma City and more. And then um, when I left the Senate after 12 years, I went back to teaching school again because I, I'm a teacher. That's who I am. Taught school for 30 some years. And um, before I went to the Senate, I taught. And then afterwards, that's when I met Brenda Hathaway. And she and I taught school our last four years together. Get this, girls, in the same classroom. And I, I never believed any two women could, especially elementary teachers, because you, we build our nest in our classroom. And she and I, she welcomed me into the classroom. I just showed up one day. She had her whole room to herself. And they said, well, you're going to have Mrs. Wilcoxon in your room. And she welcomed me. So I really love Brenda for that because that was, that was a real challenge to come back from, from the Senate and go back into teaching first grade reading. But it, it was wonderful. So today I spent time teaching a kindergartner reading in my home. So that's you know, it's just fun. I, you never outgrow being a teacher. And so today, and for the next five weeks, we're going to start at seven. Is that okay with you, Cindy and Dennis, if we start at seven? Uh, and we're going to, I don't think anybody else went to worship service. Is it okay with you, Judy and Tanja, if we start at seven? Because I have a whole lot to teach and I can't get it all done. Uh, we're going to be studying Abraham. And if you'll notice up here, I have hit that he is called the father of many nations. And so what we're going to be learning this five weeks is that he is the father of the Israelites, of the Jews. We all knew that, didn't we? And as Christians, he is our spiritual father because of his line because through his line, Jesus Christ came. And through Jesus Christ, we have become children of God. So he is the father of the Jews. He's the father of the Christians. Who else can tell me what other group of people he is the father of? Muslims. What? Muslims. The Muslims. Well, we're going to call them not Muslims because that's a religion. Okay? We're going to call them Arabs. The father of the Arabs. And their main religion is uh, Mohammedism or the Muslim religion. And we're going to see how that happened. So today we're going to look first of all at the map of where Israel is. And if any of you have ever taken any of my classes, you know that we start with where is Israel on the map. But before I do that, let's look at what we're going to be doing in this class. Our, what we're, uh, we're, you need your Bible. Okay, I really like it when people bring the real Bible, not those metal things that you have right there, Lonnie. Hold it up, Lonnie. Oh, hold that one up, Lonnie. That's what I mean by Bible. There you go. A real Bible, but my husband still ha doesn't have one. He still has that plastic thing back there. And I use the NIV, the, National, the New International Version. Uh, but there are many other good Bibles as well. And any translation, that's what I use. We will be doing this every Wednesday in June. These are the dates at 7 o'clock and uh, to 8.15. And here's what we're going to be covering in the Old Testament. We will be covering Genesis 12 through about 25. All right? So read Genesis. Hey, Jeremy. I haven't seen you in a while. This is Jeremy, by the way, Wilma and J.W.'s son. He's that missionary in, uh, where are you being a missionary, Jeremy? Niger, Africa. Niger, Africa. All right, so Brenda's going to get you a notebook. Okay, Genesis 1 through 12 this week, and here is our theme verse. And I really want everyone to learn this verse. Because people say to me, why do you spend so much time in the Old Testament? Well, the main reason is, is because it was the Bible. It was the scriptures that Jesus used. He didn't have the New Testament, did he? It was the scriptures from which Paul studied and from which he read. He didn't have the New Testament. So the Old Testament is very, very important. And here's what Paul said about the Old Testament. He said, Everything that was written in the past, and in his mind in the past, was the Old Testament. 
everything that was written in the Old Testament was written to teach us. And over and over I tell people as we study the Bible and the New Testament, if you don't understand or have an understanding of the Old Testament, you will not understand the New Testament. So he said it was written to teach us. It was written so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. You see, in the Old Testament, we learn about people who endured very difficult things. We read about the fact that they endured it, that their families, even though their families were so dysfunctional, we will read about dysfunctional families, that, they, that what they did will encourage us so that we can have hope. Do you ever go through, through in discouraging times? Do you ever go through dysfunctional family events? I don't know about you, but I do. You know, we go, we go through dysfunctional events. We read these things so that we might have what? Hope. We might have hope. All right. So now this is, that's our, you want me to go back so we can read that again? You want me to read it with you? Because I want you to remember this. It's Romans 15, 4. Everything that was written when? Was written to do what? Teach us. So that through the endurance taught where? In the scriptures. And the encouragement that the scriptures provide, we can have what? Got it learned? Memorized. Okay, good. All right. Now let's look on page. We've already finished one page. Now we're on page one, the world map. I really want you to look at this map. Turn your book this way if you need to because the world is round so you could take this piece of paper and turn it like this and it would connect, wouldn't it? So this is the world map and um, Lyndon, how did you tell me to run this? This? Oh, I see it. Okay. Let's see if I can see that. All right. Here's where we are right here. <laughs> Did I get it? No. Here's where we are in the United States, right here. And if we want to go to Israel, we're going to have to go east across the entire Atlantic Ocean. And then when we get across the Atlantic Ocean, we're going to see this peninsula uh, of, of Spain and Portugal. What's that called? The Iberian Peninsula? Isn't that what it's called? Gibraltar. Okay, the Iberian Peninsula, and we're going to go through this little bitty spot right here on your map. That's the Strait of Gibraltar. It's a little bitty waterway, and you have to, we're going to, on a boat, by the way. So we're going to go through the Strait of Gibraltar into what body of water? The Mediterranean. The Mediterranean. And whenever I am looking on a map, a world map, in order for me to find where I want to find. I've told my class this. I always look for the Mediterranean Sea for that country that is shaped like a what? A boot. A boot. <laughs> so you look for this boot right here. And when you find that boot, there's the heel and there's the toe. Do you see it on your map? You're on the wrong page. Oh, sorry. Yeah, find the right page. Okay. Uh, you're going to find, that's Italy. And once you find Italy, you stay on the Mediterranean Sea until you get to the coast. And finally, when you get to the coast, you will be in Israel. And if it's on your map, it is so tiny, you will probably not see it. Did anybody see it? Now with your neighbors, point out to each other where Italy is. And then where Israel is, if you can find it, and circle it on your map. It's very insignificant, isn't it? And the point that I want you to understand today is that Israel is so insignificant in size, but yet the whole Bible is about this insignificant, tiny, powerless nation of Israel. The whole Bible... And that's what we're going to be studying. It's what that is nation of Israel is all about. So did you find it? It's kind of there. It's right above Saudi Arabia. 
Everybody found it? All right, good. I knew you would. So turn to the page. Want me to turn the page yet? We're still looking for it. I love it. I love it when people are looking. Because you know why? You're learning that way. Okay, here is the next one. The next map on page two. This is the Middle East. This is where Israel is. All right, Brenda, you all right? Okay. This is the Middle East map. And what I want you to look at is to find um, Israel. And this map I thought was interesting because Israel is not even on there. It's the, the capital of Israel, which you and I consider Jerusalem. But in the secular world, what's the capital of Jerusalem? Tel, Tel Aviv. So find Tel Aviv, and that's where Israel is. And when we look at this country, here it is right there. Right there. Very small, isn't it? And you look at all of the countries surrounding Israel. I'm just going to read them to you. We'll start with Egypt. Look how big Egypt is compared to Israel. Then we see uh, this, by the way, right here, this little spot is the Sinai Peninsula. That's where uh, Abraham, I mean Moses got the uh, Ten Commandments. So from Egypt, then you'll see Saudi Arabia. You'll see Jordan, which is a rather small country. Um, you will see Iraq. Look how big Iraq is compared to Israel. Look at Iran. Look how big that is. They're the ones that want to push Israel into the Mediterranean Sea. You'll see uh, Syria. What's the capital of Syria, by the way? Damascus. Damascus. Damascus is the oldest city in the world, I think. And it's still there, and it hates the nation of Israel. And then you will see Lebanon. What's the capital of Lebanon? Beirut. Beirut. Hey, you've been there, haven't you, Lonnie? No, you have been or have not? Have not. Okay, now let's look at our questions at the page two. So you look at your map, and we'll pl complete these answers. Number one, Israel is in the area of the world today known as what? The Middle East. The Middle East. And we always talk about the Middle East being a place that could explode at any time, don't we? Number two, the tiny nation of Israel, find it on the map, is comparable in size. Now just think about this. It is the size of our state of New Jersey. So look at that United States map. That little bitty blue line on the United States map. That's not where New Jersey is. <laughs> in fact, that's where Oklahoma is. But it's there to show you how small New Jersey is compared to the whole United States map. And that's how small Israel is. It's a very small uh, country. And so there we go. Number three. Israel has about nine million residents. Do you know how many people in those surrounding nations that hate Israel, how many people there are? About how many enemies they might have? 300 million. I'd hate to see a war between them, wouldn't you? However, we did in 1967 and miraculously God intervened. I really do believe that. And uh, they were able to win a terrible war with Egypt. They're surrounded by 300 million enemies. Number four. Let's look at her enemies. Let's starting with Israel on your Middle East map and you go south. What country do you see? Egypt. Egypt, Egypt to the south. That's an enemy country. They attacked in 1967 Israel. They attacked Israel on their most holy of festival days. When they were least expecting it, they attacked them. And it was a terrible, terrible war. So the south, Egypt is still an enemy. If you go to the north, there are uh, two nations. What are the two nations to the north? 
Lebanon, is Lebanon, which is the capital city of Beirut. You might want to write that down. And Syria to the north. And then what's even north of that? Turkey. 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 Their capital city is Ankara. And you can see that. So if we go to the east, there are two huge nations to the east of Israel that are enemies. What are they? Iraq and Iran. Iran and Iraq. Now then we say, well, what about Saudi Arabia? Um, Saudi Arabia it just depends on the day. It depends on the oil and gas. It depends on a lot of different issues. So Saudi Arabia says, if that country is not my friend, at least, uh, if, if the, if the enemy, oh, you've heard of this expression, the enemy of my enemy. What is it? The enemy of my enemy is my what? Friend. friend. And he, the, Saudi Arabia says, the enemy of my enemy, if not my friend, is at least my what? So just depending on the day, Depends on how Saudi Arabia feels about Israel. Israel's one friend in the whole Middle East is the nation of Jordan. And you can find that on your map. So that's letter number uh, B, numbers 1 through 5. Any questions on that? Why is it important enough for me to use several ink pages and in ink on this. Why is that important? What, Lonnie? The scene of Armageddon in the last days. It is where the whole Bible is located. Right here. Is, this is where the Bible is written. When you read about any nation in the Bible, it's these countries. Maybe have a different name, but it's these countries. And when you read the world history today, it's these countries. Now, if you look at your map, I'm going to go back. And what is the big country or the country that is in news today? The big news. Oh, I'm going to have Ukraine. to go way ahead. Ukraine. The Ukraine. Anybody know where Ukraine is on this map? Do I have it written there? Yeah. Oh, well, good for me. Find Ukraine. Now I can go back. That's where it is. It's right above. That sea is the Black Sea. Black Sea is really important. It, um, it's right on the coast of Russia, and that's where a lot of the rich people go to uh, go for their summer vacations, is on the Black Sea. And so Russia really does want the Ukraine for its wheat. It's the wheat basket of the world. It's got a lot of oil that they send to, to the rest of Europe. So it's a very, very important place. We need to be praying for Ukraine. And we need to be praying for the United States that we make good decisions. All right, so now we're ready for number six. Uh, I'll go back here. I didn't realize, I do remember not writing that up there. Aren't you glad I did that? Yes. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> number six. What form of government does Israel have? Well, it's a Democrat country. They vote for their president. And it's, so it, it is the only nation in the world with a democratic form of government. All of the other nations in the Middle East, they are a, um, um, a monarchy, monarchy. What is a monarchy? Ruled by a king. Ruled by a king or a queen, but I think they're all kings right now. And they do, some of them have parliaments, but they don't have very much power. So they are absolute monarchies. There is a king in the Bible that you might want to read about. His name is Nebuchadnezzar, and you'll read about him in the book of Daniel. He was an absolute monarchy. There was no control over him. If he wanted to do something, he did it. And so it's a real interesting study of what an absolute monarchy is, and that's what's going on in these countries. So they are a democrat form of government, but the rest of those nations are monarchies. They decide the king decides what will happen. So it's very, very important that, that we pray for them too. 94% of the people in the Middle East are Islamic. 
Who founded the religion of Islam? Muhammad in about 600 AD. And um, he was from Arabia, I think. Uh, Israel, is, is that right? Israel is the only nation in the Middle East with a majority religion other than Islam. What's their religion in Israel? Judaism. Mm -hmm. But you know what? 74% of them are Jewish. But here's the really sad thing. The great majority of them are secular Jews. They don't really believe in God. They certainly don't believe in the scriptures. They don't believe in the morality of the scriptures. Just a few months ago, we had some missionary here. I forgot who it was. We had a missionary speaking on Sunday morning. And they're getting ready. He and his wife and their children are getting ready to go to Israel as missionaries. And I think that, I think that their major, he, what he told us is their major birth control in Israel is abortion. There is no rule in there. There's no moral idea that abortion could be wrong. So uh, they're very secular in their Jew Judaism. Uh, they're non-religious. Many of them claim to be atheists, which I find very interesting. So that's numbers seven and eight and six. Number nine, number letter C. What? I thought you forgot C. C. When was the modern nation of Israel founded? 48, 1948. In fact, it was found, May, it was the, the, the United Nations voted on May the 14th, 1948, to recognize Israel as a real nation. Listen, in 1948 was the first time Israel was recognized as a nation since when? The Roman Empire, 70 A.D. So from 70 A.D. until 1948, you could call that easily 2,000 years, couldn't you? Israel was not a nation. It was controlled by everybody other than Israel. In fact, the Romans said Jews couldn't live in Israel. It's a very interesting history. And this is so, this is really important for us to know as we begin the study of the fathers of Israel. And when we talk about the fathers of Israel, you can kind of think about the fathers of the United States of America. Who are the fathers of our country? I heard it. What? George Washington, um, Thomas Jefferson. John Adams, and my favorite other than those three would be James Madison. He was the one who wrote the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. George Washington was the general who brought our nation through a terrible war of independence. So they're very, very important to us understanding who we are as Americans, aren't they? Well, the people that we're going to be studying in this, these lessons are the fathers of Israel, the fathers of Judaism. And so, <clears throat> it was found in May 1948. All right. So when we look at the ancient history of the Bible, we're going to look at the fathers of Israel. And here's why it's important. And I'm going to say this over and over again, okay? When you read the Bible and if you just stop, if you just stop when you're reading it and you think, why am I reading all of this history about a small, insignificant nation called Israel? The whole Bible is written about Israel and the Jews. Why? Why would that be so important? That's exactly right, Wilma. Thank you. God chose them. He chose them. That's why they're called the chosen people. And he chose them for a very, very important reason. He wanted this nation to be set. In fact, he set them aside. He said, I'm setting you aside 
to be a holy nation. Holy. I'm setting you aside to be priests to the whole world. And I'm setting you aside so that your line, your descendants, one of them will be the Messiah. God had a plan for Jesus Christ way before he created the earth. And he said, we're going to need a savior. So I have to choose a nation to be the line of that Messiah. Isn't that wonderful to know when you think about it? They are God's chosen people. So we're, and it's from them that we get the nation of Israel. It's from them the, from the, that we get the Jews. It's from this chosen nation that we have the Holy Scriptures. If it were not for this nation, Israel, we wouldn't have our Bible. Isn't that amazing? If it weren't for this nation, we wouldn't have the Messiah. We wouldn't have Jesus Christ. If it weren't for this chosen nation, we wouldn't be here as Christians today. Because we are in that line as well. So we need to know who we are, don't we, as Christians. And that's what we're studying. We're studying the founders of our faith. That is so important. And furthermore, as you read it, you will understand the Bible better. They're called patriarchs. What's a patriarch? Father. A father. That's right. It's a Greek word. Patri means father. Ark means the top. The top fathers. So if patriarchs is fathers, what are matriarchs? Mothers. Mothers. Good job. So we're going to look at the patriarchs and the matriarchs. Today, we are looking at page three, and we're going to look at where these patriarchs and matriarchs originated. When did this event happen? When did all these people show up? Okay? And then we're going to look at who they are. So let's look first of all at the place. Now, Leah uh, stud will study this in world history, so you will know something ahead of time, okay? All right. You're going to study ancient Mesopotamia. And uh, the word Mesopotamia, look at your map, you'll see the word Mesopotamia in green. All right? You studied this, didn't you, Jeremy, in high school and world history? College. College? All right. Good. You did too, didn't you, Dennis? All right. All of us studied Mesopotamia in world history because it means um, between two rivers. So if you look at your map, I'm not sure you can see the two rivers, but here it is up here. This is where the Bible originates, in Mesopotamia, between these two rivers. And the two rivers are the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. Do you see them on your map? So the Euphrates starts way up here, and it comes down, and it feeds in to the Tigris River. And the Tigris River starts way up there, and it comes way down, and they join together and feed into the Persian Gulf. All right? Now, they were very big rivers. They still are very big rivers. I'd love to just to go see them because of history. Um, and between those rivers and, and where they filtered out, it was very fertile, very fertile. It's called the Fertile Crescent, shaped like a crescent row. So in your world history books, you'll read that that's called the Fertile Crescent because it was very, very fertile and beautiful. In fact, in that Fertile Crescent is where the Garden of Eden was located. Pretty much up north, I think, up probably up at the north part of the, Meso of the Euphrates River, almost into Turkey. Uh, this is where Noah built his ark somewhere in the Fertile Crescent. And this is where the Tower of Babel was built as well. All of the events that we read about in Genesis 1 through 11 happened in the Fertile Crescent area. Okay? So they're the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. That's the two rivers between the rivers. It's known as the Fertile Crescent. So we found it on our map <clears throat> on page 3. Look back on page two and look at that map and see if you can find uh, those two rivers. And they go right through what country? 
Iraq. They go right through Iraq. So it is no longer today a fertile crescent. What is that part, type of land now? It's a major desert. But back in the Old Testament when Abraham lived, it was very fertile. And so uh, it's, it's in Iraq today. You see that? Yes, everybody? All righty. Now, um, Garden of Eden was located there. Noah worked there. Tower of Babel was there. So let's look at page three. Where did the ancient history of Genesis take place? Letter A. The area, number one, the area is called Mesopotamia, which means what? Ali Aaliyah. Between two what? Good job. Give her a hand, everybody. Between two rivers. And letter A, what are the two rivers? Tigris and the Euphrates. And it's also called the Fertile Crescent. And then, of course, you can do number two with that. Anybody need help with number two? All right. So this is where we're going to meet Abraham. If you would look at your map on page three at the Fertile Crescent at Mesopotamia, look way, way, way down on the Persian Gulf and you'll see a little dot with a town by it called Ur. You see that? Ur. U R. Circle it because that's very important. And then look at your neighbors and make sure they've got it circled. Let's see if it's up here. It's not on this map but it would be right here. Right here. Ur. Anybody know anything about Ur? That's where Abraham came from, right here. Would be no way up there. I'm sorry, there. <laughs> I was on the wrong spot up there. Look, put it on the river. Do you want me to come back and do it again? Yeah, it's here. Oh. <laughs> I was wrong. Okay. So, when was Abraham? When did, when did he live? Anybody know how many years he was before Christ? When was Abraham? When, did, when would we put him on a timeline? We have uh, Adam, then we have Abraham, then way over here we have Jesus. How many years was Abraham before Jesus Christ on a timeline? How many, Kathy? 2,000 years. So I'm going to give you this real quick. This will help you read the Bible. Are you ready? Just put it on the back of your paper. Abraham was 2,000 years before Christ. Moses was 1,500 years before Christ. And you notice that I'm making it in increments of 500 years. Much easier than just rounding it off. So Abraham was 2,000, Moses was 1,500, who would be at the 1,000 years before Christ? David, David King David. Mm -hmm. So Moses was 2,000 years, David was 1,000 years before Christ. Someday in my Bible class on Sunday morning, I'm going to teach you because at 500 years before Christ was when the Old Testament ended. It ended at about 500 years, maybe 400 years before Christ. And so we have this 500 years here before Christ when the Old Testament ended. And then we have Jesus over here. And most of us do not know what happened in those 500 years or 400 years. I have a wonderful class I'm going to teach someday on what happened in those years between the Testaments. Okay? Questions on that? So if we look then at letter B on page 3, when will we find the patriarchs? 2,000 years before Christ. That's letter A. I mean, letter B number 1. So how many years ago was that? It was 2,000 years before Christ. 4,000 years ago. And we're still taking time out of a busy life to study a man who lived 4,000 years ago named Abram. 
He must have been a mighty, mighty, powerfully important man, don't you think? For us to still be studying him. Genesis, we meet him in Genesis after the flood. So he occurred after the flood. This is number B1, after the flood and the ark. And um, number two, after the construction of the Tower of Babel. Now very quickly, who can tell me, this is Genesis 11, all Genesis 1 through 10 or 11, we're studying about uh, the creation of the world, we're studying about the fall of man and the need of man for a savior, we're studying about Noah and the ark, and then we get to chapter 10 and we study the Tower of Babel. What happened at the Tower of Babel? Because I want you to go and read it this week because I'm not going to read it to you. What happened? Lonnie, real loud now. Well, it was Nimrod and his cronies decided they were going to build the, the Tower of Babel. Okay, why were they building the Babel Tower? To reach God. To reach God, okay. And then what happened? So they're building this tower, and then what happened? God looks down, and he sees man trying to elevate himself to the level of God. And so what does God do? Doug. He uh, put different languages into people so they couldn't understand one another. And so when you don't understand a, per a group of people, what do you do? You move, don't you? You move. So all these groups disperse throughout the world. You, you find people that speak the <clears throat> language and... Language. And you hang out with them, don't you? <laughs> and the scriptures say that's why that tower was called the Tower of Babel. Because it means confusion. He confused the people. So let's look now at this. Genesis 11. I'll be sure and go and read that. That's the account of the Tower of Babel. And so it ends with God dispersed, confusing the people with their languages, and they disperse, they scatter throughout the world. That's how it is that we have nations today in various languages. And it's very interesting to tell that to people. And so the scriptures tell us in verse 9, that is why that tower was called what? Babel. Uh, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. So that's why we have languages that are, are different. So let's look at um, some of these uh, pictures. Well, okay, here, you remember we just called you, just talked about Ur, and it's right here on your map, or put it on your map, right on the Euphrates River. That's where the Tower of Babel, they think, was, was built, right here. And you can go, and that's in Iraq today. And uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of the history of the Tower of Babel. It was a ziggurat. Now, it's interesting. You can go to South America and find these ziggurats. They're everywhere. People scattered throughout the world, and they built ziggurats everywhere. So you can find them. So it's nothing that is uh, unusual to find an zig ancient ziggurat anywhere in the world because that's when God scattered the people. And this is the ziggurat of Ur. And you can see the stairway leading up to the top of the tower. And it was built approximately 2,100 years ago. And they have found it. I think it's so fascinating. Um, many consider this to be the original tower. It was 650 feet high. And at the very top of these towers, you will find a shrine. And at the shrine is a big golden table, and that's where they worship the celestial gods, at the top of the tower. And uh, a massive table of solid gold, and on the table was a bed, an ornate bed, uh, on which each night a woman went up there to await the pleasure of the gods. So it was rather uh, paganistic, wasn't it? And so that's what the ziggurats were. And the, yes, Lonnie? Did you have a question? No. Okay. So this is the Tower of Babel that was painted by uh, Peter Bruegel. If you, ever, if you study your ancient art, 
1563, Bruegel painted this, and he made all of his people, you can't see it, but you might be able to see it in your, in your notes, but Bruegel made all of his people uh, wearing the clothes of uh, med uh, medieval Europeans because that's just the way he painted it at the time, which I thought was kind of funny. And uh, they worshiped the celestial gods, and stairways were built for the purpose of climbing those stairs to meet God, or for God to come down, perhaps, and to meet the people. Reminds us, doesn't it, of the story of Jacob, when we learned that with Linda McNabb last time, last course, when the angels came up and down the stairs to meet the people, and they went back up the stairs where God was. And so we have this same kind of picture in the Tower of Babel. 1,500 years later, so this was, it was 2,100, so about uh, 1,500 B.C. Uh, it, it was in great decay, 600 B.C. King Nebuchadnezzar was in Babylon, and he started to reconstruct that that ziggurat. And you can go right today. It's in Babel, it's in, it's in uh, Beirut, no, Baghdad in Iraq. You can go into Baghdad in Iraq today where Saddam Hussein lived, where we had the big war, and they have found this ziggurat, and they are digging through it, and they're finding actual bricks that were built 1,500 years before Christ and uh, Nebuchadnezzar's name on it. He's rebuilt it, said built by, or 500 years before Christ, I'm sorry. And it was, uh, he was tried to reconstruct it. He had bricks with his names on them. So then Saddam Hussein decided to rebuild the ziggurat. So you know what he did? He found those bricks and he added his name to those bricks. Rebuilt by Nebuchadnezzar and Saddam Hussein. Isn't that amazing? They're still found out there today. Then Alexander the Great decided he would rebuild it. And they did such a terrible job that it collapsed, pretty much, or burned up. I'm not sure what happened, but it was, they were unsuccessful. And so the tower, by the time of Jesus, had gone into such ruin and decay, it had been covered up by sand. Okay? covered up by sand. It was lost to history. And it wasn't found until uh, about, what is my book, what do my notes say? Uh, the great, letter B at the bottom, the great ziggurat was discovered in 1850. All that time it was under the sand. And they discovered it in 1850. And that's a picture of it right there with Iraqis climbing it. And then we know that Saddam Hussein rebuilt it, and here we have a picture of the United States of of the soldiers climbing, this, the climbing the ladder of the ziggurat of Ur. Where is that? Oops, there it is. The American soldiers climbing it. Did you get to climb it, Lonnie? You weren't in Baghdad? Iraq. I was right on the border. Okay. Now, the reason I wanted to tell you that was because that is the context of the patriarchs. It was during this time that the, that the, um, of the ziggurat of Ur. And so let's look. I've got a few minutes. Let's look at Genesis 12. And if, I, and if you uh, have any questions, be sure and just stop me. Let's look at Genesis chapter 11. And there we read about the Tower of Babel. All right? So be sure and read that, the Tower of Babel on Genesis 11. Now look at the very last couple of verses of chapter 11. Let's start with verse 27. You there? This is the account of Abram, later named Abraham. Verse 27, his father was named Terah. Terah had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And then it tells us all about that. The name of Abraham's, Abram's wife was Sarai. Now look down at verse 31. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from where? 
er. What do we know about er? That's where the ziggurat is. Okay, that's where the ziggurat was built, the Tower of Babel. They set out from Ur to go to Canaan. And when they came to Canaan, Haran, they settled there. And Era, uh, Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. So, the reason I told you about Ur was because that's where the Tower of Babel was built. And it was during that time that Abram lived there. He saw the Tower of Babel. He saw them worshiping other gods. And God called them out of Ur to go to another land. Let's look at verse 12, verse 1. So we see that Terah died. And the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country. Now imagine this. Leave your country. Leave your people and your father's household. He wanted them to leave because they were worshiping other gods there, weren't they? And he said, I want you to go to the land I will show you. So we're going to look at this right quick. The whole book of Genesis was written, and Genesis 1 through 11 was all about mankind, okay? Not about any one person. But it was written by Moses, Genesis 1 through 11, Answer all the questions that you and I ask. Where did man come from? Why does man need salvation? That's chapter 3, isn't it? Um, how did man survive the great flood? That's Genesis 8 and 9. Genesis 10, where do the various races and the nations and the languages come from? You'll find that in Genesis 10. Genesis 11, where did all the languages come from? Listen carefully. All 11 chapters are about mankind as a whole, okay? Chapter 12 is a dividing point in the Bible that is very, very important because chapter 12 starts with the line of Abram, introduces us to one man that changed the whole world, changed the whole history of mankind. We're going to follow his family. What was the man's name? Abraham. Abraham. Named as Abram, later named Abraham. We place him 2,000 years before Christ. Jesus comes directly through the line of this chosen man named Abram. So let's look at this real quickly. Because you, have you ever read? <laughs> I know how when I, <clears throat> people tell me they tried to read the Bible. And they say, but when I got to the begets, I just couldn't get any further. So I say, don't ever read the begets. Just come to see me about it, okay? Don't ever read the begets because you will quit reading the Bible, won't you? <clears throat> but this is what those begets tell us. That the first man was named what? Adam. Adam. Adam had three sons. What was their names? Cain, Abel, and Seth. Now watch the lines. We don't follow the line of Cain. We don't follow the line of Abel. We follow the line of Seth. So from Seth, we, ten generations later, we meet what man? Noah. Noah. Now this is all in those begets that I don't want you to read. Okay? So, Noah had three sons. What were their names? Shem. Don't look, don't look at your paper yet. You look up here. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham had, a, had descendants, so did Japheth. But we're not fond of following them. We're going to follow what man? Shem. Shem. And we just read about one of his descendants in chapter 11 named Terah. Terah had three sons. Haran and Abram and then another man right here in the middle. And he died, so we don't have his name there. It's in the Bible, but I can't remember. Okay, so Shem has Terah, and he has three sons. We don't follow Haran, because there's Lot, and we know about him. We're going to follow Abraham. So let's go. Are you ready? Start with Adam. Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem, Terah, 
Abram, Isaac, Jacob, 12 tribes, Jesus. Isn't that interesting? You want me to do it with you again? Y'all over here say it with me. Because this is why the Bible is so important. Start with Adam. Ready? Go. Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem, Terah, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, Jesus. That's why the Bible is so full of begets. Because it wants you to see this. So let's fill in the line, fill in the blanks here. You ready? Uh, page four. Who goes on the first block? Adam. Put him there. And from Adam to Noah, we have ten generations. So what's the next person we go to? From Adam, then Noah, right? Y'all with me? And then from Noah, ten generations, we meet Terah. Put Genesis 11 right here so you know where Terah comes from. The last verses of Genesis 11. Terah is the father of whom? Abram. Abram or Abraham. That's right. So put Abram right here. Now you remember the Lot, the nephew Lot? He's the one who lived in what, two city, in what city? Sodom and Gomorrah. That's that lot. So we'll study more about him. Now let's follow the line of Abram. Are you ready? That's this. Uh, let's see. Anybody need help with that chart on your paper? Okay. Let's look at this one. We're following Abraham. So Abraham has two wives and a concubine. I remember when I found out after Sarah died, he got married again. I was really mad at him for doing that and having six more sons. He's only 120 when he <laughs> married her. Okay, so Abraham, uh, he had Hagar, his uh, concubine right here. Who was his wife? Sarah. Sarah. And then his third, his third woman was Keturah after Sarah died. Now what line do we follow here? Sarah. Abraham and Sarah. So you go from Abraham, what do I have on your paper? Do I have a blank there? Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. What, okay, let's do Hagar. Abraham and Hagar, what was their son's name? Ishmael. Ishmael. We'll study him. Abraham and Sarah, what was their son's name? Isaac. Isaac married a beautiful girl named Rebecca. And Rebecca and Isaac had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob's other name was what? Israel. Israel. I remember when somebody taught me that, the whole Bible opened up when I realized that Jacob was also named Israel. The 12 tribes of Jacob. 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so what else do we have here? Rebecca and Rebecca and Isaac had Jacob, also named Israel. And then Jacob had four wives. What are their names? Bila, Leah, Zilpah, and Rachel. His favorite wife, by the way, was Rachel. When you have a favorite wife, gentlemen, uh, and you have three others, it's going to be a dysfunctional family. <laughs> and it was very dysfunctional. Okay. Who's, where does the line go from Abraham to the Messiah? Through whom? Leah. Leah. So find Leah. And then you go down and she had Reuben, Simeon, Levi. And then I put a blank there and you've got to put in the name Judah. They had a son named Judah. That was the line. That was the chosen line. Judah. And Issachar and Zebulon and Dinah, their daughter, Dinah. From Judah, we get David, King David. And then from David, we get whom? Jesus. Jesus. Now let's read that. Let's make sure we understand that. Okay? okay? We go with Abraham and Sarah. We have whom? Isaac. Isaac. Isaac and Rebecca, we have whom? 
also named Israel. Jacob and Leah have Judah. Judah. Judah's descendant is David, King David, and Jesus comes through that line. Now you don't have to read any of the begets unless you want to follow other lines. Is that interesting? Begets, yeah, I don't have to follow begets anymore. Just, just look at that. Questions? All right, so next week we are going to look at um, Abraham's call. So that will be page, you know, I wanted to get through page five, but I don't have to because I don't have to. But we'll finish up next week. And then we're going to do um, page seven. We're going to study Abram himself, who he was. I hope you don't give up on me. Well, this is good stuff. <sighs> so, who can tell me why this is important? Or is it? Why is it important? Somebody help me. Kirk, tell me. Well, you need to know the lineage of how we look at Jesus. Because once we know how we got to Jesus, we'll know who we are, won't we? What, Jackie? I was going to say Norma. Yeah, okay. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. Well, I'll see you next week at 7 o'clock, and I'll get through a little earlier. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all the begets in the Bible and that we don't have to read them, but we have nice people who put them on charts for us. We thank you for that, Lord. But we thank you that we know who we are as Christians because we know from where we've come. And that's the purpose of the Word of God. Thank you for your plan and that we will learn that this week and next week. And we'll give you the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for letting me be your teacher. Thank you.